Welcome to FaithWorks, the enlightening and empowering program that builds your faith to help you overcome every single challenge in this life. My name is Kaude Adeshoga. I'm your host. I want you to sit back, listen, and be blessed. God bless you. Amen. Now, um, today, we're looking at prayer and faith result oriented prayers. And um, God wants you, he wants to answer all your prayers. I, I was meditating on the part of the word of God when Peter asked the Lord, how often should I forgive my brother if he wrongs me? Is it seven times or 70 times? Jesus said, no, 70 times, seven times a day. Now, if that's about 490 times a day, now, if you can forgive somebody 490 times a day, and he says, forgive us as we forgive those that sin against us, it means you can approach God's throne 490 times a day, I'll put it on the minimum, and you will get those 490 results. And so, there is a principle between successful prayers and what I'll call um, routine, regimented non result prayers. Now, I'll be starting in Luke 11. Luke 11. One of the things I will implore you is to take tradition away and um, look at the Word of God from a very objective view and from a very broad mind. In Luke 11, from verse 1, and I read, It came to pass... That as Jesus was praying, he was praying, as Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Meaning, they noticed there is a successful prayer life about the Lord Jesus. And they also observed there's a correlation between his prayer life and the results he was having. So, they too wanted results. Everybody wants results. And so they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. Meaning, prayer has to be taught. It's technical, and that's why it has to be taught. It had principles it operates on, that's why it has to be taught. And I guess they observed the way he prayed was different from the way the Pharisees prayed. And so they asked him, teach us the way you pray, because we too want to have results the way you do. And then he began to teach. Now, you all know the Lord's Prayer that he taught and said to them. And I'll jump to verse 5. Maybe I should just go through all that. And then in verse 2, he said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So he just gave them a basic format to pray with. Then he went further in verse 5. Still talking on prayers. And he said, which unto them, which of you shall have a friend... And shall go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he said, From within, and he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed, I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needed. Then he said in verse 9, he's still talking on prayer. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, you shall find. Knock, it shall be opened. For everyone that asks, receiveth. He that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Now let me stop there for now. Um, he's trying to say that, look, Two things, take note of these things about prayer. Number one, which of you having a friend will go to him at midnight? And so he's telling you approach God in prayer 
like a friend. Now, when you get to your friend's place, some of you want to pray. Say, my dear Heavenly Father, maker of heaven and earth, King of kings and Lord of lords, we give you praise. God knows if it's from your heart. He knows if it is reotics. He just wants you, when you go to your friend, you are honest. God says, come and be honest. Yeah, he gave a format. When he says, uh, when you pray, say after me, our Father which have been in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. But he's saying, approach God with all honesty. If you are stressed, don't go and sit down, and you are tired, don't say, you know, you're a wonderful father. There is no, 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 no. If you're excited, be honest with God in your approach in prayer. The second thing he's saying, he said you must have importunity. So prayer transcends relationship. So the fact that you see visions, you are caught up to heaven, doesn't mean your prayers will be answered. What he's saying is that there are techniques you must abide with, which includes importunity, which we'll look at where the importunity comes from, how the importunity is brought in into the prayer mechanism. So here he's saying, approach God as a friend, be bold when you approach God, believe you will receive what you ask. He said, for he that asks receiveth, seek you shall find. So that's why Hebrews eleven six 6 says, he that comes to God must believe that he is and is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So when you go to God in prayer, you're going to leave that presence of God with a reward. You're not living empty-handed. If you pray a thousand times a day, you have a thousand reward every day. So when you go to God in prayer, don't even contemplate that whether he will not answer you. Believe. He said when you go, go with importunity, go with audacity, go with boldness. Go believing. Then go as a friend. You know, when you go to your friend's house, your good friend, you knock. Maybe his name is John. Say, John, I beg, I'm hungry. You say, John, the son of Mrs. Uh, Olua, so, so, and so, born on so, so, and so, the great, he'll be wondering what's wrong with you. What's all this? What's, what, what is all this? Is he food you want to ask that you're going through all this ceremony? There are times you will praise him. There are times you will give eulogy to your friend, maybe on his wedding day or something. You say something nice about him. Not when you are hungry, you need food, then you start praising, you'll be wondering, what, what's that all about? So what he's saying, that be normal with God, be casual with God, be honest with God. Those are parameters that will guarantee that your request will be answered. Amen? If you're the type that every time you pray, you always praise God, then praise God. If you're not the type, and then you are in, you're in trouble, don't come and start praising him. Every time you pray, say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this, I thank you, I need this, this. Then when there's big trouble, you now know that, hey, Father, you are the king of kings, ancient of this. No, 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 no. That's not going to make him answer your prayer at all. Then be bold as you approach the throne of grace. He says, come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy at the hour of need. That bold is not to come rudely. It's to come with an assurance that whatever you step into that throne to ask of your father in the name of Jesus Christ you are going to get it. He's going to give you audience, not because you are righteous, not because you are holy. He's going to give you audience because you're approaching his throne in the name of his holy son, Jesus the Christ. Now, we'll go into some technicalities and then um, we've just looked at some basic points when he says, Luke 11, teach us to pray. So prayer needs to be taught. So if you want to have a successful prayer life, you need to be taught how to pray. Some people cry during prayers. It doesn't guarantee your prayers will be answered. Crying does not make your prayer get answered. Presenting your facts properly in the right order guarantees your prayers will be answered. Now, I want to go to Mark 11. Mark 11. Um, we call it one of the greatest faith scriptures that teaches us and exposes the God kind of faith. And there are three things you must know if your prayers will be answered. Three things you must take note of if your prayers will be answered. So, Mark 11, 
I read from verse 12 to 14 first. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came if happily he might find anything thereon. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. Verse 14. And Jesus answered and said to the tree, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Now I jump to verse 20. And in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Another translation says, in the course of time. And Peter, calling to remembrance, said to the Lord, Master, the fig tree you cursed yesterday has already withered away. And Jesus answered and said to him, have faith in God, or have the God kind of faith. Verse 23, for verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. That's a confession. Whatever you say, and you believe it, you shall have it. Verse 24. Therefore. Now in English you start a statement with therefore. Meaning you are considering a preceding statement. So you don't really start a fresh statement with therefore. You can't start a letter with therefore. That means there's something you have said earlier on. Then therefore based on what I said earlier. I'm now making this point. So therefore I say unto you. What things soever you desire when you pray. Okay. So meaning the verse 12, uh, the verse 12 to 14 and 20 to 26 is talking about prayer. Though is emphasizing confession. He now said in verse 24, therefore, when you pray, what things soever you desire when you pray, Believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Verse 25. And when you stand praying, forgive if you have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. 26. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. So, He's talking about a principle in prayers. Looking at this all together, it means there are three major things in prayer. The things you desire that you tell God. The confession you make in line with what you have discussed with God. And what you do in line with what you have asked God that you are confessing. So there's a threefold operation. There's a, um, there's a request to God. There is a confession that must follow. And this is why people don't get results when they pray. You know, once you follow this principle, no matter what you will get. Prayer is a technical thing. It's not a relationship thing. So even if God brings you to heaven and returns you every time, and you don't know how to pray, you will not get results. If you don't see heaven, you don't see angel, and you know how to pray, you will get results. Because prayer is more technical than relationship. So, Jesus said in that Luke 11, he said, though he will not rise because he's his friend. That's Luke 11. Though he may not rise because he's his friend. So, God is not going to answer your prayer because, because you... You're always in going to heaven and return. No, that's not going to make your prayer answered. He said he's not going to rise because he's his friend. He's going to rise and give him because he refuses to back down. That is the confession. So where there is no confession, God may not rise. 
Do you desire to live and operate God's way of doing things? Do you desire to understand how faith works? Fundamentals of Faith is a book written by Kayode Adeshoga. It teaches in simple terms how to operate the God kind of faith that helps you overcome all hurdles of life. Fundamentals of Faith is available for purchase at Trem Bookshop Obani Koro Lagos and Bible Wonderland Stadium Suruleri Lagos. Get a copy today. Now, in Luke 11, he says, and this is where people just miss it. They ask God and they go to sleep. No, 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 no. Though he heard you, it's not enough. In that Luke 11, you need to follow me. I'm doing a teaching and it's important you get it right. He says, verse 7. Now, the guy is calling his friend. I have a visitor. I don't have food to give him. Please give me some bread. And the friend says in verse 7, and he from within say, don't disturb me. My door is shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give you. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend. So, you went to your friend, he's giving a story. At midnight, an awkward time is also telling you there is no time that you cannot get your prayers answered. There's no specific time for prayer. It's not in the morning. I remember once I was with a man of God, he said, ah! He said that 3 a.m. is the best time to pray. I asked, why? He said, because at the time the witches are meeting, I said, are you praying to witches? You're praying to God. You're not praying to witches. If you want to address witches, wake up at 3 a.m., but I don't need to wake up at 3 a.m. If I want to sleep, I'll just speak the word into the atmosphere. Every word is living. The Bible says even careless utterances you make, they're waiting for you to give account for it on the day of judgment. So you just speak into the atmosphere and go and sleep. When it's 3 a.m., the word will rise against the witches and vanquish them. But then he said, it's the best time to pray. I said, no, there's no best time to pray. He has said it here. Though it is midnight, he got the answer at midnight. The most awkward time, that story no, I, I don't think any person will answer a neighbor at 1 a.m. and say, please, my neighbor, do you have sugar? Eh? If you say there's an emergency, you want to take your child to the hospital, some neighbors can answer you. Please, my neighbor, do you have sugar? My cousin just came from America. He wants to drink tea. Most people will tell you, let him wait till morning, he will not die. But you see, he got an awkward request at an awkward time at a very timing that is just not convenient. But he got it. And Jesus also making a point there that there's no time that is too late, too awkward for you to pray. You can pray morning, afternoon, evening, midnight. There's no best time to pray. The best time to pray is when you need to pray. And then he's saying his friend will not rise because they are friends. He's not going to answer him because they are friends. But he's going to answer him because he's not backing down. This guy keeps knocking at my door he will not let me rest. So it's best I rise to answer him. In verse 8, I said, though he will not rise and give him because he's his friend, yet because of his importunity. So what God is saying is, in as much as you have made your request, he wants to hear your confession day and that importunity is the confession which God is what God is going to use to rise and answer your request. So the threefold aspects of prayer is the request, the confession and the corresponding action. The corresponding action that aligns with your request. And once those three are in line, you have your answers right there. So back to Mark 11. Um, it says in verse 20. For believe that you receive them and then you shall have them. So what are you supposed to believe? You're supposed to believe God has heard you. The Mark eleven twenty three. 23. You're supposed to believe what you are confessing that is a line that God has heard you. And then the corresponding action that validates 
the release of what you are asking for. Now, let me give you an example. We want to assume that this person is asking for forgiveness. So he's saying in verse 25, we want to assume because he's using forgiveness as an example, meaning this person is asking God for forgiveness. Now, Jesus is saying here, though you are asking God for forgiveness, if you don't forgive those who have wronged you, your prayers will not be answered. Meaning, there's an exact corresponding action that aligns with your request and is a condition for your prayers to be answered. So this person asking for forgiveness, he has asked God for forgiveness. I don't know whatever he did wrong. He asked God for forgiveness. Now he's going to begin to declare, my sins are forgiven. I have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. I declare I am whole, I am holy, I am sanctified. He's making those declarations. Then he now forgives those who have wronged him. Now when those three align, there is nothing. And I repeat, there's nothing you ask God in this life that you will not get it. Let me give you one or two examples. In Matthew 6, 12, Matthew chapter 6, I read verse 12. Now, um, that's also the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, which is sins. And then verse, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Verse 14. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. So that just confirms, if you're asking God for forgiveness, you must forgive people. Otherwise, if you ask God for forgiveness, you confess that you're forgiven, and you don't act to forgive people, the prayer will not be answered. If you ask God for forgiveness, you don't confess you're forgiven. You forgive people, the prayer may not be answered. It's a threefold operation. Now, let's look at another example. Let's say a lady is asking God for her husband. She's yet to be married and she wants to get married. And asking God, because you can ask God to give you a husband. Now, what God does, if you ask him for a husband, he's going to play the same role, the same way he did it for Adam. And the Bible says he took the hand of Eve and presented Eve to Adam. So when you ask God for a husband, God is going to take your hand as a lady and present you to a man. Now, in Proverbs 19, 14, Proverbs chapter 19, verse 14 says, I read, House and riches are the inheritance of fathers, and a prudent wife is from the Lord. If you are not prudent... If you are not prudent, if you ask God for a husband, you make your request known, then you begin to confess and say, I am Hepzibah, I am Beulah, literally me married. You are confessing that. Said, I, a man has found me, a, I'm, I'm highly favored, my husband seeks after me, I'm like a city on a hill sought after, and you're making that confession. If you are not prudent, God will not present you to a man. He will not do that. So you need to be prudent. To be prudent means to have your facts and your detail presented in well order. So God is going to he's not going to present a scattered woman to, to a man. He's going to present an orderly woman to a man. So you need to be prudent for that prayer to be answered. Now let me give you another example. In Luke chapter 16, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 16, and I read... Um, Verse 11. I'll read verse 11. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Meaning, if you are asking God for financial breakthrough, he has heard you, then you are confessing that I have abundance and no lack, I'm a giver, I lend, and I borrow to nations I don't borrow. I lend to nations I don't borrow. 
And you say, I therefore have sufficiency in all things. And you're confessing that. But you are not faithful in the unrighteous mammon. The little money you have, you don't give God his due. You don't, you don't give God his due. You hold back God. He said he's not going to give you the true riches. Meaning that prayer will not be answered. But if you ask God for a breakthrough in your finances, and he hears your cry, and then you take the confessions of finances, I've given, therefore it's given back unto me, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, men are running over, pouring into my bosom, and then you give God his due, he will give you the true riches. That prayer will be answered. If you look at also in verse 12, and says, if you had not been faithful in that which is another man's, who will give you which is yours? Meaning, if you're asking God to reveal to you your ministry, you want to know what to do, but you're not faithful in the ministry where you are, he will not answer the prayer. Now, if you ask God, Father, I know you've called me into the ministry. What do you have for me to do? Oh, you begin to confess. I know I, 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 I have the Spirit of God in me, and so I know all things. I perceive all things accurately. The Holy Spirit takes off things of the future. He reveals them unto me. But the work they gave you in the ministry, you are not doing it. He will not answer that prayer. Meaning, successful prayer is a threefold operation. The request, the confession, and the corresponding action. I believe you have been blessed by that message. And I know your faith has been built up. And I know all those challenges in life are all going to fall before you in the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to know Hebrews 12 says, Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. You need him in this walk. And so if you're out there and you don't have Jesus in your life, I want you to say after me, say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the only begotten Son of God. Come into my life, be my Lord and my Savior. It's as simple as that. Displayed on the screen is diverse information on how you can interact and reach out to us. Take advantage of it and I'll be expecting to hear from you. Till I come your way again, same time next week, I want to tell you, don't give up. Faith works. It's working, and it will work in your life. God bless you.